Thank you, Chairman Waddell and members of the board. My name is John Walsh. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Aquarion. Uh, and with me here tonight is Carl McMorrin, our Manager of Operations in New Hampshire. I think many of you know Carl. Uh, Dan Lawrence, who's behind me, he is our Director of Engineering and Planning. And John Hurley, he, uh, who's going to do most of the presentation, he's our Vice President of Water, Water Quality and Environmental Management. Uh, so tonight we'll be presenting information about PFCs in the groundwater and in the drinking water. Uh, and we'll also be presenting our multifaceted approach to addressing this emerging issue. Uh, before I hand it over to John, I just want to express uh, that we are as uh, concerned as you and our customers about PFCs in the groundwater and in the drinking water. Uh, providing high quality water is our highest priority. We take our job very seriously. Uh, so uh, on this issue, we are committed to understanding the extent of uh, the PFC uh, uh, concentrations in the groundwater, the sources of those PFCs, and also the risks to all of our wells. We're committed to sharing all of that information readily with our customers and public officials um, like yourselves, and we're committed <coughs> to addressing uh, the concerns of our customers and public officials, uh, the concerns that you have about PFCs. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, John Hurley. Thank you. Yeah, I just John, would you explain what a PFC is, please? <laughs> Throw up the rules right away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you very much to the board for allowing us the time to present, and thanks to the public for coming out. So, uh, what we're going to cover tonight is a discussion of how our system works, where the water comes from, what are PFCs, as the chairman has asked. Uh, talk a little bit about the levels of PSCs that we've found through our testing, both in the drinking water that the customers receive, but also in the wells in the ground. In some cases, it's different. And then what, uh, what actions we are taking to address the PFCs that we have found. Okay, so this is uh, what we call our Hampton system. We supply customers in Hampton, North Hampton, and Rye. Uh, we have 14 wells. We have a well field up here on Winnicott Road that has seven wells. Those seven wells uh, blend inside the treatment plant. Their uh, treatment, disinfection treatment is applied, and then it goes out into the distribution pipes uh, at one point. Down here on Mill Road, there are six wells, but there is no uh, centralized disinfection treatment, so there are four different treatment facilities and that enter the Mill Road water main at four different locations. And then we have three wells that are uh, single source supply. So well 5A here in uh, Rye and well 7 down here in Hampton and well 14 in North Hampton. Also want to point out that our well 22, the well that we have uh, requested uh, to be able to add to our sources of supply is located down here in Hampton. Uh, very close to well number seven. Okay, so PFCs, perfluorochemicals. Okay, so these are uh, a large group of chemicals. There are hundreds, I am told, hundreds of these uh, PFCs in existence, and they were developed because they have uh, properties to repel water, repel oil, and they're also heat resistant and chemical resistant. Uh, so they're used in clothing to uh, prevent staining. Uh, they're used in clothing and other materials uh, to repel water. Uh, they're also heat resistant, uh, so flame retardant clothing. Uh, also in fire suppression, firefighting foams, uh, and that type of thing. So, and they're used in products that uh, are found uh, in residences also in commercial establishments and in industrial applications. So they are widespread and they're ubiquitous in the environment. They're, they're, and being ubiquitous in the environment, they've been found in water, air, soil, house dust, and food. So there are different avenues of exposure to people, to PFCs. Water is one of them. Uh, either by ingesting it or through the skin, air, in your respiratory system, 
uh, soil and house dust. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's ingested. You can get it on your skin, and then food. Uh, and the reason that it's so ubiquitous is that it, it's found wherever the uh, PFCs have been manufactured, uh, stored, used, or disposed of. So you may have uh, PFCs in some of the products you use in your house, perhaps uh, cleaning products, and they may end up going down the drain. And that may end up in a septic system, may end up in a sewer system. And that's one of the avenues where it can get into groundwater is through a septic system. Another one would be a landfill, where all kinds of things have been disposed of, and then the uh, PFCs, along with other uh, chemicals, can leach uh, into the groundwater. Uh, so PFCs are considered an emerging contaminant. And what that means is that uh, we weren't talking about PFCs 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, but within the last 10 years, EPA became aware that uh, these are compounds that they should be looking into to determine the toxicity and determine whether or not they should set an enforceable drinking water standard that public water suppliers would have to uh, comply with. We, we would have to make sure we're delivering water that has no more than X amount of PFCs in it. Uh, and that's enforceable standard is called a maximum contaminant level. So currently, there are no enforceable standards, no maximum contaminant levels. But EPA had uh, public water providers test for six PFCs back in uh, 2014 and 2015. And based on those results, they set a preliminary standard called a health action level, health action limit at uh, for two of the six uh, PFCs that were tested at the time, uh, PFOA, which is perfluorooctanoic acid, and PFOS, which is perfluorooctane sulfonate. So they set a, a limit of 70 parts per trillion for each of those two compounds individually and the combination of the two. So. If you test your water and you have uh, 40 parts per trillion of PFOA, you're in compliance with the PFOA limit. But if you have uh, 40 parts per trillion of PFOS, you're in compliance with the PFOS limit. But together, they're 80, and you're exceeding the combined standard. So, uh, so those are uh, that's a preliminary standard. While they while they continue to investigate the toxicity how much PFC are people exposed to through drinking water compared to food and air and other uh, vectors. Uh, but in the meantime, they've set this standard at 70. And what they've indicated is they do not expect to have any adverse health effects at a level of 70 parts per trillion or less. The laboratories uh, test for PFCs at the part per trillion level. And so that's a very small amount. Most of the parameters that we test drinking water for are at the part per million or part per billion level. And a part per trillion is a million times lower than a part per million. Uh, so it's a very, very small level. Uh, the, the methods used to test for it are in their infancy. Uh, the detection limits for the, the uh, uh, PFCs have decreased by uh, a factor of 10 in the four years that we've been testing for them. Uh, currently, most of the PFCs are, uh, have a detection limit on the order of one part per trillion to 10 parts per trillion. Currently, we are testing for 14 PFCs, whereas in 2014 and 15, it was only six. So the whole science uh, including the, the testing part, the, the health effects part, is at a very early stage, and it's evolving. Uh, New Hampshire has also uh, set a limit for PFOA and PFOS, and the com combination of the two also at 70 parts per trillion. Uh, New Jersey has set a, a preliminary standard at 40 parts per trillion just for uh, PFOA. And uh, Vermont has uh, set a standard of 20 uh, just for PFOA.
Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, what the PFC concentrations are that we have found in the drinking water. So I'm distinguishing uh, between what's in the drinking water, meaning the water that's in the distribution system that the customers receive, as opposed to the water that's in the wells in the ground. Uh, and in some cases that's very different, like with the mill road wells. Uh, so we did the, uh, the testing uh, that EPA required us to do in 2014 and 15. Uh, and then in 2016, we started testing on our own. So we were doing research. Uh, there were 96 different uh, tests performed in these two years. So uh, six PFCs times eight samples times two years. And we only got one detect. But because we had that one detect in well six, we decided uh, to do more testing because we knew that the uh, detection limits had gotten lower and lower. And so we did the testing in 2016 and we found more. And then we did more testing in 2017 to follow up. The range of results for the most recent testing in 2017. So in 2017, we tested in June and we tested uh, uh, in early August, uh, and we've also tested in late August, but we don't have the results back yet for the late August testing. It takes three weeks to get results back from the laboratory. So the first week of August results per PFOA and PFOS are in the range of two to seven parts per trillion. That's compared to that 70 part per trillion level of concern. And then if you take all the PFCs, so all 14 that the labs can currently test for, uh, the results are in the range of 3.9 to 15 parts per trillion. So this is a schematic of our uh, distribution system, and we have the Winnicott wells up here. So the purpose of this is to show you uh, the levels that we find in our distribution system. So currently, we only have two distribution results, uh, but we're expanding that uh, in September. Uh, but where we have uh, the Winnicott wells, so all the wells are blended in the treatment plant, and then they enter the distribution system at a level of two uh, in the first week of August. So you would expect that the customers in this area of the system uh, would be getting uh, two parts per trillion of the PFOA plus PFOS. And these are, you know, some of our primary mains here, but the point is that there's a lot of demand in the Mill Road area, there's demand in the summer in the uh, Hampton Beach area, and so the, the water goes to where the biggest demands are, and so there's blending that occurs along the way in the system. So the, the water from Winnicott, blends with the water from well 14, which has a seven parts per trillion number, and then it continues down towards the center uh, where the big demand is, and the mill road wells come into play. Uh, well seven is over here, and then up in Rye we have uh, well number 5A. But you can see that uh, these PFOA plus PFOS levels, the total for those two, are very low compared to the uh, EPA and NHDES standards. Here's uh, another way of uh, looking at those results in the drinking water. Here's, here's the 70 limit for EPA and New Hampshire. And here are the individual uh, PFOA and PFOS levels here. You can see they're very low compared to the 70, but also compared to the 40 that New Hampshire, that uh, New Jersey has established. And, the, and, and again, New Jersey, it only applies to the PFOA, so the darker bars. And Vermont also it only applies to the PFOA. So the drinking water that's in the distribution system that cu customers are receiving, the levels of those two regulated compounds are very low compared to the level of concern. And now we're going to talk about the <clears throat> levels of PFCs that we've found in the wells. So again, we've, uh, we've tested for the last four years, and uh, the range for uh, 2017 results for 
PFOA and PFOS in the wells has been undetected. So a couple of our bedrock wells, uh, we didn't detect any of the 14 compounds. Uh, and then uh, well six uh, had two detects in 2017 that were on the order of 25 parts per trillion. And that's the highest level we've detected for the two regulated compounds. For total PFCs, all 14 of them, again, none detect in uh, some of those Winnicott wells and even some of the Mill Road wells, uh, up to as high as 88 uh, total for the uh, 14 compounds in well number six. Can I ask a question, intro, please? Can I go back to that? Just that, that previous slide, please. And I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so, no. So, right this there. One? Range 2017 total PFCs. You say that 88 represents five compounds they're testing for? 14. 14. Okay, thank you. But, John, we're only, but not all 14 were detected. Right. So we detected, uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, a total of seven PFCs out of the 14 have been detected at all. There are seven that we have not detected in any sample. Mm -hmm. So it could be uh, seven or six or five. I, I don't have it in front of me, but seven, uh, seven of the 14 have never been detected in any of our testing. Okay, so now, again, this is the water that's in the wells. And the main point of this graph is to show that for most of our wells, uh, the levels of the PFOA and PFOS are very low, individually less than five, most of them combined less than 10. But then we have two samples from well six here, uh, where the levels are on the order of 25 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS combined. So this stands out from the rest of these results. Something's going on here. And uh, these wells here, these are the Mill Road wells. And you can see something going on here, something going on here. Uh, so uh, we, we need to uh, look further into that and determine uh, it, it's apparent that there's a, uh, a source or sources of PFC contamination reaching the Mill Road wells, whereas the other wells are very, very low levels. Okay, so what are we doing about it? So there are three primary activities that we are taking in response to this uh, data that we have obtained from our monitoring. Uh, num action number one is uh, increasing uh, the level of our monitoring. So 14, 15, and 16 we monitor once in the year. Uh, in 17, uh, so far we have monitored three times. We have results for two of those three. Uh, but we have decided that we are going to, starting in September, uh, we're going to monitor for six months in a row at 14 points. So six of those points are in the distribution system so that we build up our database on what are the levels that the customers are actually receiving. And we're also going to do more monitoring of the uh, mill road wells and also well 5A in Rye. Uh, the reason for well 5A is because there's been uh, reports of uh, concerns about multiple landfills that might be impacting uh, 5A. We don't see high levels right now, but you know we want to make sure uh, that we're not impacted in the future. Uh, Mill Road, we're focusing on those for obvious reasons. That's where we're finding the highest levels uh, in our sources of supply. Uh, <clears throat> so those results uh, will be uh, shared with the town officials and also posted on our website. So right now, on our website, all of our test results are there. We have a, a list of frequently asked questions. And in the fourth question, there's a link to a table that has all of our test results, every sample that's been uh, uh, tested. And when we get the results back from the late August sampling, those uh, which we're expecting by the end of this week, uh, probably early next week, those will be uh, up on that website also. 
Okay, action number two is to investigate uh, groundwater contamination with PFCs at the Mill Road well field. So why? Because that's where the highest levels are. And here we are coordinating very closely with New Hampshire Department of uh, Environmental Services. Uh, so they're, you know, their health group, and uh, Brandon Kernan is the lead there. Uh, I'm in contact with him every week. Uh, they have uh, begun monitoring of test wells on uh, properties uh, where there's potential for PFC contamination. And he's also uh, obtained samples from some private wells because PFCs can impact private wells as well as uh, public wells. Uh, so the monitoring has been gone, begun. We have also retained a hydrogeologist to help us uh, identify uh, potential additional uh, sources of contamination up, uh, aside from in addition to what uh, New Hampshire DES has already identified. Uh, and, and our hydrogeologist is in communication with uh, DES also. Uh, so the purpose here is to identify uh, sources of the current contamination, determine whether we need to put down additional monitoring wells. So these are small wells that we would uh, put in between our production wells and the uh, known sources of contamination and potential sources of contamination. And then we would sample them and have them tested and then review the results with the consultant and with New Hampshire DES and share them with uh, the uh, town leaders also. And that information uh, will help to identify where the contamination is coming from in the Mill Road uh, wells and then, you know, what can be done about that? Can it be abated? Uh, action number three is similar to number two, but it applies to all of our wells. So we're going to take the same approach that we're doing with Mill Road. Mill Road's the most urgent because it has the highest levels, but we have these other well fields and other single wells, and we want to do an assessment of what the contamination risk for those wells are also. Uh, the levels are low currently, but we want to get assurance uh, that we don't have a contamination plume heading for those wells. And if we do find a contamination plume, to work with DES uh, to uh, develop more information on it and then determine can can that pollution be abated uh, before uh, it gets to our wells. And action number four is uh, we're doing a treatment evaluation for the mill road wells. So that involves looking at uh, the different types of treatment that are available. For example, granular activated carbon is one type of treatment that is known to uh, be able to remove PFCs. We're looking at a couple of other types of treatment also. And then we're, we're determining, uh, getting an assessment on uh, treating different combinations of the well. So do we just treat, if we just treat well six, uh, this is the impact, this is what's involved, this is the capital cost and the operating cost, all the way up to treating all of them together. And that information will be uh, presented to the town leaders. Uh, and we have uh, a preliminary assessment due in about two weeks from our uh, consultant and uh, should have a final uh, recommendation in about a month. For the alternatives analysis. The alternatives analysis, right. And that's my presentation. Question. Do you have anything else to present or? No, we'd be glad to take any questions. Okay, let's start. Regina, do you? Um, yeah, I'd like to actually stem off what uh, Jim and Waddell said earlier. I was that we actually had a meeting this morning with all these officials from Aquarian. And I, w I got to tell you, I feel a lot better after listening to your presentation today. And I probably feel even a little bit better now. And I'm very happy that you're going to work with us to be proactive on this to make sure that, you know, we make sure that we have clean water like we always had. And I just am really looking forward to working together, putting this all down. I think it's going to make a lot of people feel better. And can I get that presentation? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. 
Rusty, I'm all set this time. Mr. Griffin. Um, excuse me, I'd like to know who does your testing? Our testing is done by Eastern Analytical Laboratory in New Hampshire. Well, we send the samples to them. They do not have the capability to perform PFC testing, so they sub the work out. In 2014 and 15, they <coughs> sent it to a, uh, a laboratory approved by EPA for the, uh, the required testing, a lab in California. Uh, in 2016, they subbed it to a lab owned by the same company in Pennsylvania. 2017, uh, they have subbed it uh, to um, a, another lab in California, a different lab. Do you feel that this is something that the state should be doing? I understand the state doesn't have the, they would like to do this uh, in the uh, Department of Public Health or whatever, but they don't have the uh, manpower. And it's not funded. But would that would it make it better? Would it be a better situation if the state was able to do this testing? Uh, I'm really not qualified to answer that, but uh, I know that they are using some of the la same laboratories that we have used. Again, it's still early days in the laboratories and developing methods and producing results that are accurate. So uh, I think the labs that. EPA approved to do the testing in 2014 and 15. I kind of have a leg up on the other labs. They've been doing it longer. Uh, so I think uh, New Hampshire DES is doing the right thing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, what it would entail to get the expertise in-house, the equipment, mm -hmm. uh, in order to do it uh, in, at their own uh, facility. Yeah, so I was talking with someone at the state labs, and they said they have, they would have the ability to do this, but they just don't have the funding. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Aquarion. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to try and sound like the smartest guy in the uh, room on, on these issues because it's biologic. Uh, the uh, state of New Hampshire held uh, hearings with the Public Utilities Commission, and this is just for public uh, situational awareness. Regina was there. Uh, the delegation was there, Mr. Geraldo was there. Uh, Commissioner Bailey uh, asserted our right as uh, uh, interveners uh, and uh, as consumers that irrespective of who owns uh, uh, the, this water company, uh, and no matter what happens between Eversource and Aquarian, that we have direct access with PUC, uh, with the uh, Public Utilities Commission. Mr. Gerald can uh, back me up on this, he's nodding his head, that we can address uh, the issues that are, are of concern to us directly to the Public Utilities Commission. So while we are encouraged by Eversource's uh, 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 role, new role, and this uh, stock purchase um, that Hampton independently uh, is going to pursue what's in the best interest of uh, uh, the citizens and consumers of water. The granulated activated carbon, uh, uh, I would say, and again, not an expert, uh, there's um, the state of New Jersey. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, your remedies and, and potentialities going forward to treat it. They have, uh, they've already got that in my meetings with Eversource. Uh, July 1st, 2015, uh, they've uh, established those lower limits uh, that uh, are a fraction of what the Department of Environmental Service allows uh, for PFCs and PFOAs uh, for those carcinogens in our water. You showed those on your graph. Uh, so they're already there. And uh, our question, of course, in Hampton is uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, ascribe to those lower limits. And when you show a bar graph with a, a small limit on 70, uh, when, when you show that, that bar graph on, on Mill Road uh, and you tested um, uh, uh, and you had a reading of 88 and seven of those came out, well, you're halfway to the New Jersey maximum limit on some of these wells. And we don't think that's safe. I don't think it's safe. Uh, you are the, the, those, there's different ways to look at data, but if you take New Jersey's limit and you take those eight wells that showed nothing, or eight, eight tests they're showing, um, half the limit that's already in New Jersey. They've got granulated, uh, gran uh, the activated carbon. 
2015. They've set those lower limits. So we're not relying uh, on uh, anybody but Tom Ballestero, our um, uh, expert that we've hired. Uh, New Jersey has a whole committee, statewide committee set up for this. And they're now, um, 2015, we're into 18, three and four years ahead of Aquaria, head of the state of New Hampshire. And uh, th those are standards that um, uh, when you say uh, it's safe in their minimal, I'm looking at the data a different way, and I say it's a, a perennial uh, and sudden onset of a challenge, and that uh, I, I wouldn't agree with your assertions uh, that it's a safe level uh, and it's, it's minimal compared to the limit. I think the limit established by the state of New Hampshire is too high. Uh, we should be uh, drinking water and have limits as equally as safe as New Jersey, and I've lived in New Jersey. Uh, and they have a lot more contaminants down there, and they can get it safe. The GAC process, and we've talked about this uh, in Concord. We've talked about it in Boston with Eversource. Uh, Mr. Walsh is nodding his head. It's not that expensive to implement, and we're looking for those capital expenditures um, going forward and uh, a more robust and aggressive, uh, while, we, while we we're happy with the partnership, but a more robust prevention, a more robust testing. And finally, uh, we've got the... Uh, Copley Landfill Group, and uh, we spoke earlier, and, and, and get off the high horse here in just one second, Mr. Chairman, is that it is a united front. It's Aquarian. Aquarian didn't pollute this water. Eversource didn't pollute this water, so we welcome uh, Eversource's locality uh, and their, uh, uh, their juxtaposition of effort with Aquarian and your expertise in, in the utility to uh, um, bring this to a head. There was a 21 September meeting that uh, the Coakley Landfill Group, this will come up later on uh, in our meeting tonight, they're trying to hold that in, in private, which I, I uh, and perhaps others on this board would say that's in violation of the state constitution. Certainly not transparent when we have this alarming uh, unknown plume, as we called it, and you called it. So going forward, um, those are my concerns. Again, Mr. Gerald would uh, uh, equally back up uh, that we have direct, ac direct access, no matter how this merger goes out, and I'm sure it's going to go through uh, with this, the PUC, and we, we, of course, reserve that right, and we'll look for your hydrologist to work with Dr. Ballastaro, who we, we just reinforced him with some more um, pecuniary uh, assets uh, to his benefit to work with you folks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Do you folks have anything else, Mr. Jerome? Sure. Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned in the presentation is that uh, despite the fact that the uh, in this emerging field, uh, the fact that the, the levels set so far by the EPA have not been met, nevertheless, Aquarian has shut down well six out of, out of an abundance of caution, and I think good caution. Um, we have alerted them this morning, as Mr. Bean has just indicated, to the fact of this meeting on September 21. And uh, I want to let the board know this is a meeting of the Coakley Landfill Group. Coakley is probably the nearest source that has is an identified uh, potential source of PFCs. Now, that's to the north and west of of, of this well field that is showing these levels. And so far, that has not been uh, studied, whether or not there is flow coming in this direction. What is needed are the kind of monitoring wells in it to find out if that is the source. And uh, Aquarian is proposing to put, put some of those in at their expense, but nevertheless, it should be the responsibility of the Coakley Landfill Group, which is the uh, the uh, potentially responsible party group that is in charge, has been in, put in charge by EPA as of the Superfund site to do those explorations at their expense. And that is what we are urging uh, the EPA and the, and the DES to do. Um, nevertheless, if this meeting is conducted in a non-public session, the public will not know what EPA is requiring. And uh, I, I agree 100 percent with um, Selectman being that this is something that we should uh, we should should be conducted in public, as was the last Coakley landfill session group session that was held in Northampton in uh, mid August, and so when it comes time to discuss that at, the, at that point, or we can do it at this point, I'm suggesting to the board, and I have written the EPA and uh, DES and suggested to them that we strongly uh, want this meeting to be conducted in public in the Seacoast area where the public can see what is going on and have a meaningful insight to what's going on. And uh, 
time. And aren't we going to discuss that later? Aren't we going to bring up something later on that? We, just... we can, but I've, I've all, we have also urged Aquarian in the meeting this morning to join with us in urging that this meeting be a public meeting. Okay. Yeah, with respect to this meeting, we, we believe in uh, all parties sharing information. Uh, we surely will share information with folks. It's what our Action 3 is all about. And we list stakeholders, stakeholders up there. Coakley Landfill Group is one of the stakeholders. Uh, and we uh, would like to know, uh, definitely would like to know the results of this meeting. Um, and I would, uh, I would assume that that information would be shared with all of us. Um, once that meeting is convened. I have a question. Have you ever known in Aquarian Water Company at all, total company, have you ever had a polluter that you found out about? Uh, John, do you know? Yes, yes. Uh, down in Connecticut, we, we've had, you know, in the mid-1980s, no one heard about PFCs, but the big thing was leaking underground storage tanks. Uh, Leaking underground storage tanks, so gasoline tanks. So we had a, a well field in Salisbury that uh, uh, showed some gasoline hydrocarbons. And so we did a similar thing. Uh, we worked with the state and we uh, put in some monitor wells and we determined that uh, gasoline was coming from two gas stations. There were tanks in the ground that they weren't even aware of that, that still contained some gasoline. So they pulled those tanks out and we are still monitoring those 30 years later. We're still monitoring our monitor wells to detect where the plume is at this year. And as far, did you have to treat for that to get it? We ended up not having to treat for it uh, because the, the, the traces that we found initially in one of the monitor wells went away. But the threat is still there. Yeah, I would say this, Mr. Chairman, and I really want to drill down on this, and I'm, I'm looking for uh, an enthusiastic support on this. There's uh, a Seacoast Media Group uh, article on this, and uh, Attorney Sullivan, I'm going to, I'm going to be, um, and we can incorporate this into the motion later on so we don't have to repeat it. Uh, September 21st is going to be an EPA DES meeting. City Attorney Bob Sullivan, who serves as the CLG's Executive Committee. Now, he's the attorney for Portsmouth, City of Portsmouth, okay? Subsequent, this is Mr. Sullivan, subsequent to that meeting, okay, we would propose, now their water's not imperiled, ours is, perhaps. We would pro propose that we provide an update of Coakley activities to the city council in public session. So he's going to talk, uh, as the city town manager, or the city attorney, to the city of Portsmouth in public session about stuff that perhaps is affecting our water. And, and people don't say there's a conflict of interest. People say that we want to you know, hear what's going on at this closed meeting, which we will uh, protest. Um, and then we're talking about Mr. Murphy from the EPA. He's the spokesperson. I don't know what his, his pedigree is. Uh, but he says uh, that's a pretty in-depth in investigation. It usually takes a couple of years. This is a current article just prior to this. And this should concern you because water is your product. Um, and, and just going on. Um, the, suspend, the Superfund record of decision on management of migration in Coakley did provide a cost analysis for four source control alternatives, including the natural attenuation that was chosen. That was the cheapest method that they could possibly get away with. And in $1993, it was a measly 2 to $3 million. And it was chosen, and now we're still 30 years later facing this problem. During an interview Tuesday, Sullivan, Sullivan acknowledged any request for CLG to install a pump and treat system, which may be what we need more quickly than not, would be a significant and expensive proposition. So this is public information that's out there. It's ominous. Uh, it is one-sided. It is strictly serving the interests of Portsmouth. There's no mention of Hampton. Um, we have a letter out to the uh, town attorney uh, in, in Portsmouth who serves as the CLG. It is the uh, prisons in charge of the, uh, the uh, cell keeping over there. And uh, I would ask um, that, that we hear from all of you tonight at Aquarian uh, on behalf of Eversource going forward that you support us in uh, opposing that meeting being private that uh, if we uh, pursue any legal actions to uh, uh, open up that meeting, that you join us in that. It's our water. It's your company. You've done nothing to do it. And if I were an Aquarian executive, I would feel very concerned about people 
polluting my product, perhaps. He's talking about taking two years with the EPA spokesman. And we don't need to hear about spokesmen. We need science and we need hard data. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a response, Mr. Chairman, from you folks uh, that you will enthusiastically support that that meeting be public and you support any efforts of your customers to drink your water uh, that this 21 September meeting uh, be held in public and support our legal efforts to do so. I think having just heard about this meeting this morning, um, you know, not knowing the goal or agenda of the meeting. My understanding is EPA, New Hampshire DES, and the Coakley Landfill Group are going to be at that meeting. I don't know the other if there's any other parties. As I said, we don't know. I don't know the goals for that meeting. I don't know the agenda for that meeting. Um, I'm presuming it's a some sort of technical session. Um, so without knowing that, um, I don't. Um, what I can say is we want to know the results of that uh, meeting, the outcome for that meeting. We would expect that there would at least be uh, a continuation of the public meetings that have happened recently with the Coakley Landfill Group and that the information from this proposed September 21st meeting would be shared at a, at a public meeting. Uh, but I think without knowing uh, the specific goals and the agenda for that meeting. Um, uh, I, um, I don't know that I can support it as enthusiastically as uh, Selectman Bean is requesting. Okay, and, um, and just to follow on, and, sure. and got that, and I'm not going to press you on it, John, but uh, it's the uh, EPA that says this is going to take a couple of years, okay, a couple of years. Uh, from a 30-year-old problem with an unknown plume, perhaps heading towards our wells and we've shut one down. Um, and, and let me quote, unless Mr. Attorney Robert Sullivan, who is the uh, head of the CLG, uh, he, he's going to be with the EPA, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. The EPA says this is a couple of year issue. They've taken the shortest and cheapest way out of this 30 years ago. Uh, and the uh, Department of Environmental Service has limits that uh, are, are uh, hugely exponential compared to uh, what I just read you from uh, what the state of New Jersey has. And then what Mr. Sullivan is quoted as saying is he expects with the DES and the EPA, which we're not satisfied with, uh, their standards or their uh, timetables, that he expects sub substantive discussions with agencies, those two agencies, concerning an expansion of group responsibilities related to emerging contaminants such as PFCs. Now that's just, that's just legalese, you know. And, and you guys, by, by third party, maybe an email, um, maybe a telephone call, and uh, get the information. And uh, I will tell you that it's, it's not a standard that we're going to accept, and we're going we're gonna to discuss it later on tonight. But I, I would think that um, you folks would join us. Uh, and again, I'm not going to pin you down, but it's ominous and it's threatening, and uh, we're taking it very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Skip Webb from the advisory board had requested to speak. Is that all right with you? It's your appointment. Yes. 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 Okay. Skip, can you keep it quick? <laughs> keep it quick, please. Skip Webb, twenty-eight, Seabury. Well, Aquarian Water contacted me a week ago, asking if I was speaking on their behalf. I had the meetings with them that several of you have had, and I was of the benefit of getting some of your input given to me at that meeting. I think both the selectmen and the water company deserve to be complimented on the way that they have worked to protect our water supply. This is a complicated issue, and one of the things that uh, wasn't brought out, I think, in the uh, presentation was that the increase in well six is a spiking. It's something that happened recently. It's not something that has materialized over a period of time. So this means that it might be something that's permanent, or it might be something that is temporary. The testing that's been put into place will tell us that. 
but I think it reduces the concern to the public if they know that it might be just a temporary spike. During that meeting, I took a different approach. They were telling me, we're testing these wells, we're going to add these other surface wells so that we can test them to see how the PFCs are progressing in the area. I took the approach, what has happened that have, might have caused an increase of PFCs in our local well? Here we have a, a the, the second to the closest well to Hampton. It is in a large aquifer that the well in Hamptons draws from also. The aquifer goes from the borderline North Hampton up to under Route 1, under the center of town, down to the edge of our own landfill. So what has happened in that area that might have caused some changes? We, two years ago, or three years ago, uh, Fred Welsh could confirm when, it doesn't have to, but we did a uh, large change of groundwater flow, uh, putting in pipes and hoping some residents on Mill Road because of the fact that they uh, were flooding. Uh, that might have changed the flow from Route 1 over to where these wells are. Another one is on White's Road and the conservation property off of it. And for years we tried to say we shouldn't be building on that property and then on the edge of it, uh, they asked if they could put in a subdivision. And that subdivision, the water company did research and said that really won't affect the well that much. But that's a change that could have affected the flow of water into that well. The other are the businesses along Route 1. Uh, what do we have? We have a couple of closed gas stations. Those could be giving us a problem. And then we have our own landfill. The aquifer goes up and touches the water side of that landfill. So that whole landfill is very close to the area that could be polluting our water supply. There has been no evidence that it has been. And because of the fact that the well in Hampton isn't showing the increase in PFCs, that particular possibility is actually very low. Skip, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to hold you to the three minutes of public comment. It's the same thing as public comment, what you're doing. So if you can kind of wrap it up, please. Okay. Um, so I have uh, the water company has said that they will also look at those locations and try to, uh, in their determination as to where the PFCs are coming from. And I'm, thank you. Thank, thank you, Skip, very much. Yeah, thank you very much. You had a question? I did. I want to say I want to say something that we talked about upstairs. Aquarian um, is prepared. Is Aquarian is going to be testing everything, and they have a plan in place. They showed us the beginnings of a map they put together, and I am confident that they will do what they need to do. Like Mr. Bean says, no level is safe, but seven looks better to me than 23. I don't want any. I'm sure none of us want any. 
but they have put procedures in place like they said it's in the infancy but I have confidence that they are going to do what we need them to do is our water company, our water provider. Okay, Skip, thank you, because just well, like other, public um, comment, we're not going to go back and, and forth. Is, with um, my concerns are the same as what those yep. are that Phil Bean yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Skip. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate it. We appreciate the much. effort, and uh, let's keep it going forward, all right? Let's keep everything transparent and working together. Thank you. All right.